Alright, this is chapter 8 homework for physics 101. It says if the torque required to loosen a nut that is holding a flat tire in place on a car has a magnitude of 40 newton meters, what minimum force must be exerted at the end of a 30 centimeter lug wrench, so that's my moment arm, 0 0.3 meters, to accomplish this task, what torque is equal to force times the moment arm times the sine of the angle and the the minimum force that is what you have to the minimum force is going to be when this angle is equal to 90 degrees so that makes this whole term go to 1 so I'm looking for F it's just going to be the torque over the moment arm that's 40 over 0.3 zero meters. So that's equal to 133 newtons. Calculate the net torque, magnitude, and direction on the beam in this figure about an axis O perpendicular to the page and then about an axis C perpendicular to the page. So first I want to uh, calculate the torque about that point and then about that point. Now I'm just going to label the torques by each of these forces, torques 1, 2, and 3. And then for part A, uh, the sum of the torques about the axis O is just going to be positive torque 2 plus torque 2 minus torque 3. That's because rotating about the point O, torque 2 causes a motion in the counterclockwise direction, so that's positive, and torque 3 causes a motion in the clockwise direction, so that's negative. Because remember, counterclockwise is positive, clockwise is negative. So um, I want to know what is the net torque. Torque 2 is going to be uh, F2 times R2 sine of theta minus F3 R3 sine of theta 3. It's theta 2. Now our theta 2 is actually going to be this angle which is 60 degrees. So if I put in my numbers here I have 25 newtons times the distance which is 2 meters. It's a sine of 60. Uh, minus F3, which is 10 newtons, 4 meters, which is the distance to the axis of rotation, the distance from here to the axis of rotation, which is about 0 0.0, times the sine of 20. If I put in those numbers, I get a, a, a torque of positive 29 newton meters. Because it's positive, it is counterclockwise. If it came out negative, it would be a clockwise torque. That's for part A. For part B, is very similar. The sum of the torques, or the net torque, is going to be positive torque 1 minus torque 3. Torque 1, if I'm rotating about this axis, torque 1 causes motion in this direction. That's counterclockwise, so it's positive. Torque 3 causes motion in this direction. That's clockwise, so it's negative. Alright, so this is equal to, uh, I'm just going to put in the numbers, 30 newtons, which is the force 1, times 2 meters, which is the distance from where that force is applied to the axis of rotation, that's 2 meters, times the sine of the angle, which is 45 degrees, minus 10 newtons, times 2 meters, times the sine of 20, put in those numbers, I get positive 35 newton meters and because it's positive it is again counterclockwise. A cook holds a 2 kilogram carton of milk at arm's length as in this figure. What force must be exerted by the biceps muscle? Now I know I'm going to just draw this as a different figure. This is my axis of rotation. There's my moment arm. I have a force FG acting in that direction and then I have FB acting in this direction. This angle is 90 minus 75 or 15 degrees and of course this angle is 90 degrees. Uh, the distance which I'll call RG the distance from here to the axis of rotation is RG and that's equal to uh, 25 plus 8 centimeters so that's what uh, 33 centimeters or 0.33 meters and then I'll call this distance RB and RB is equal to uh, 0.08 meters.
So uh, now I say that the sum of the torques is equal to zero and you can go through and figure out which torque is counterclockwise and which torque is clockwise but since you know that this is a static situation you know that the torques have to balance one another out so I can just say that the torque due to the milk carton which I'll call G has to equal the torque due to the bicep and then I can just dispense with all the clockwise counterclockwise business all right so uh, I just set those torques equal because you know that they have to balance one another the torque due to the milk carton is going to be the weight of the milk and carton times the moment arm and that has to equal the angle is 90 degrees and the sine of 90 is 1 that has to equal FB RB times the sine of 15 I am looking for FB so I'll just solve this for FB that's FG RG over uh, RB sine of 15 and that gives me my if I put in my numbers I have uh, 2 kilograms that's my mass I have to multiply it times 9.8 to get the force weight of the milk carton RG that's uh, as I've already said 0 0.330 meters divided by RB 0 0.080 meters sine of 15 degrees that gives me my answer of 312 newtons you know just to give you an idea that's approximately equal I don't know about 80 pounds so your bicep really has to just holding your arm out like that stretched out your bicep really has to exert a lot of force to hold a fairly light object alright four objects here on position at the corner of a rectangle by light rods as shown in this figure find the moment of inertia about the x-axis the y-axis and an axis O perpendicular to the page. All right, so first, let's do through the x-axis. That's part A. Uh, my moment of inertia is defined as the sum of mr squared. So I just want to add up mr squared for each individual particle. I'll call uh, this particle 1, particle 2, particle 3, and particle 4. And then so mr squared is going to be m1 that's this particle times the distance from that particle to your axis of rotation which is the x-axis so that distance is three meters squared a square plus m2 times three meters squared excuse me three meters should be three meters that number squared plus m3 times three meters square that number plus m4 times three meters squared. So you see all the masses are the same distance from the distance from the axis. So I can simplify this greatly. I just have M1 plus M2 plus M3 plus M4 times three meters and then that's squared. So M1 is three and so I have three plus two plus two plus four five seven eleven kilograms. times uh, 3.00 keeping proper sig figs squared that's going to be 99.0 kilogram meter squared all right so that's about the x-axis for part b about the y-axis i again is the sum of mr squared now for the y-axis all my particles are going to be a distance of two meters so i'm just going to skip ahead in a similar way as I did about the x-axis, it's going to be m1 plus m2 plus m3 plus m4 times r squared, which is going to be 2 meters. And so that's going to be uh, 11 kilograms times 2 squared, which is 4. Excuse me, 2 squared is 4. So that's uh, 44 kilogram meters squared. But that's about the x-axis, or excuse me, about the y-axis. And now for part C, an axis through O, through this, and perpendicular to the page. So it's like the whole page is turning. And your axis of rotation is going to be this distance. I'll call it R. I can find it from the Pythagorean theorem. R is equal to the square root of 3 plus 2 squared. 3 squared plus 2 squared. That's the square root of... Uh, what, 13 is 3.6 meters 
And then I do a similar thing. I is the sum of mr squared. Each particle is the same distance from the axis of rotation. That's that 3.6 meters. So it works out to be 11.00 kilograms. That's m1 plus m2 plus m3 plus m4 times 3.60 meters squared. And that gives me 140 kilogram meters squared. So those are our answers. And each one's different depending upon the axis of rotation. Now this one was easier because each particle is the same distance from the axis of rotation, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. And we can look back, you can look back at some of the old exams and see where that's not the case. All right, a 10 kilogram cylinder rolls without sleeping on, slipping on a rough surface. At an instant when its center of gravity has a speed of 10 meters per second, determine A, the translational kinetic energy, B, the rotational kinetic energy, and its total kinetic energy. So for part A, I just want to know its kinetic energy. It's one-half mv squared. It's fairly simple. Uh, I know the mass. It's one-half 10 kilograms times v. The speed is 10 meters per second. That's squared. See, that's 5 times 100. I get 500 joules. So my kinetic energy is 500 joules. Now for part B is a little more complicated. I want to know it's rotational kinetic energy. And that's one half I omega squared. Remember the rotational inertia is analogous, if you will, analogous to the mass, which is a measure of the inertia. And omega, the angular velocity, is analogous to the linear velocity when we're talking about a rotational frame. So uh, I have one half I omega squared. Now I for a disk which is what this is, is equal to one half mr squared. That's on your, uh, on your table with your moments of inertia. And further, we know that v is equal to omega r, so omega is equal to v over r. So I can make these substitutions in for this. I get ke equals one half of i, which is one half of mr squared, times omega squared, which is v over r squared. So look, our r squareds cancel, which is good because we don't know r squared. And this becomes to be 1 quarter mv squared, which is half of part A, which is 250 joules. So that's part B. And then part C, we want to know it's total kinetic energy. Well, it has both rotational and translational kinetic energy. So we just add up the two values, 750 joules. So that's the kinetic energy, the total kinetic energy. All right, horizontal 800 newton meter merry-go-round of radius 1.5 meters is started from rest by a constant horizontal force of 50 newtons. Applied tangentially to the merry-go-round, find the kinetic energy of the merry-go-round after three seconds. Let's just write down some things that we know. First of all, the weight of the merry-go-round is 800 newtons. So I can go ahead and calculate its mass. It's going to be the force weight over G, which is 800 newtons over 9.8 meters per second squared, which is 82 kilograms. The radius is 1.5 meters. The force that you apply tangentially at 1.5 meters is 50 newtons time of three seconds and I want to know what is the kinetic energy. All right, well I know kinetic energy like in the previous problem is one half I omega squared. So I first need to find out what is I and then I need to find out omega. So those are two separate sub problems. The moment of inertia of a disk which is on your uh, on your table for moments of inertia of rigid bodies is one half mr squared. That's one half of 82 kilograms times 1.50 meters squared. That's equal to 92 kilogram meters squared. Then I need to know what is omega. All right, omega is equal to omega naught plus alpha t. All right. So I know that omega naught is equal to zero, but I don't know what alpha is. So I need to figure out what is alpha, my angular acceleration. Now I know what force is being applied to this. So if I know the force and I know the moment arm, then I can figure out the torque. Now torque, Newton's second law says that torque is equal to I times alpha. It's an application of Newton's second law on a rotational frame. 
And further, the torque is equal to the force times the moment arm. It's equal to I times alpha. So I can solve this for alpha. FR over I. Putting in my values of 50.0 newtons. R is 1.50 meters. I I've already calculated. It's up here is 92 kilogram meters squared. So that gives me an alpha of a 0.82 radians per second squared. So now I have that part. Now I have everything that I need. I can determine the kinetic energy is one half I omega squared. That's one half of 92 kilogram meters squared times 0.82 radians per second squared. And that's squared. And that gives me 260 joules. And if you want to just look at your units, you have kilograms, meters squared, or excuse me, this is uh, not second squared, this is second. So our, our units work out as kilogram meter squared per second squared, which is the appropriate unit for, for the joule. All right, 260 joules. Okay, uh, let's see, this should be, this should read number seven in the homework. Okay, you have a system of small objects shown in this figure is rotating at an angular speed of two revolutions per second. The objects are connected by light flexible spokes that can be lengthened or shortened. What is the new angular speed if the spokes are shortened to 0.5 meters? All right, you have these, these beads or these objects, these masses. They're rotating around. They're at a distance of one meter. And then they come into a smaller distance. That's going to effectively uh, decrease the moment of inertia, which is going to increase the angular speed. All right, it's going to speed up when, they, when the masses come in. And this effect is seen in a lot of things uh, in the formation of galaxies and planetary systems and what have you. As you have this material that's collapsing inward, it has a certain angular rotation rate. And as those things collapse inward, that angular rotation rate increases. Right? Because the moment of inertia decreases, the rotation rate has to increase. That is omega. Now, the problem is, is that you look at these galaxies and they're not really rotating fast enough. So there are a number of different explanations for that, which I'm not really going to get into right now. But anyway, we want to, let's just write down what we know. Omega initial is equal to two revolutions per second. The initial radius is equal to one meter. And then the final radius, the rotation radius, is 0 0.5 meters. And we want to know what is omega final. So I say my initial angular momentum is equal to my final angular momentum. That is that uh, I initial omega initial, I'm going to use o zeros here, is equal to I final omega final. Now in the course of this I need to calculate, or if I solve this for omega final, it's I naught omega naught over I final. So now I need to determine what is I initial and what is I final. So my I initial is equal to the sum of m r squared, all right, because all the particles are the same distance from the axis of rotation. It's a fairly simple calculation. I just say that it's equal to uh, m plus m plus m plus m, and since r is the same for all of them, times 1.0 meters squared, so that's equal to 4 times m, all right. That's the the variable m, not the abbreviation for meter. So this is 4m, and that's measured in kilogram meter squared. All right, so I also need to find what is I final. I final is the sum of mrf squared. And uh, that's going to be m plus m four times, times my new distance, which is uh, 0.5 squared. And that gives me uh, or just 1m because it's a quarter of 4m. So m and the units are kilograms meters squared. So I plug that in here. And I find that omega final is equal to I naught, which is 4m, times omega naught, which is uh, 2 revolutions per second, divided by just m. So my mass is 
cancel, which is good because I don't know the masses anyway, and I find that the rotation rate increases by a factor of four. Because my moment of inertia decreased by a factor of four, my rotation rate increased by a factor of four. And it's eight revolutions per second.